So let's turn in our Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. If you don't know where Jonah chapter 4 is, it's right after Jonah chapter 3, right before the book of Micah on page 488. If you're still having problems finding it, you can close your Bibles to the middle, or close your Bibles, open them to the middle. You should be in the book of Psalms. Then head to your right. That's this way for you guys. Past Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, into the major prophets. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, which actually isn't a very big book. Uh, Ezekiel and Daniel, then slow down because the books get a lot shorter. You got Hosea, then Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and then Jonah. If you hit Micah, you've gone too far. Just look back a page. Uh, you should be there. Jonah chapter 4. Remember, Jonah, I love Jonah. It's like Teaching through the Bible is work. Is, I, I do love it. It's work. But when you get to Jonah, it's like eating candy. It's easy. It's fun. It's exciting. The first chapter is about Jonah not wanting to obey the Lord. So he runs off to Tarshish. Basically, he's going to Spain because God told him to go to Iraq. I mean, it's not, it wasn't Iraq back then, but that's where Nineveh was uh, geographically. So it was like, Nope, don't want to go that way. I will go as far as I can in the other direction. For you guys, it's this way. And uh, God says, uh, no. So God prepares a storm to stop the boat from forward progress. Then Jonah says, okay, if you want the storm to stop, throw me overboard because it's me who is disobeying my God that causes the storm to hinder all of us. And so the other guys are afraid. They're frightened. They don't want to throw Jonah over. They don't want to kill him, but they realize that they can't progress in the storm, and they are afraid they will all die. So they pray, and they ask God to forgive them for killing Jonah. And they toss him overboard, and then God prepares a giant fish to come swallow him up. You might think it's a whale. Sure, it's a whale. I don't care. It lives in the water. It's got a fin and a tail. And whether it goes this way or this way, it doesn't matter. We didn't start naming them fishes and whales till like the 1700s. Uh, before that, everything was just a fish. So uh, the, it makes sense that would be a, a sperm whale, but, you know, that's a whole different discussion. Anyway, the, the fish swallows Jonah, holds Jonah in his belly for three days and three nights, and then spits him back out on land. Chapter 2 is his prayer in the belly. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. We just wish the repentance kind of held a little longer, right? Um, and so he spits him out on, on the dry land. Jonah finally says, okay, God, I'll do what you want. God says, go to Nineveh, give them my message, and he goes to Nineveh. It's a three-day journey just to travel around Nineveh. I don't know how long it took him to get there, but once it's there, it takes him three days to go and, and, and tell everybody God's message, and God's message is, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overrun. 40 days, that's it, and then you guys are being judged. And Jonah just gives them that message. He doesn't give them any message of hope. He doesn't give them any message of, uh, it's not like, it's just a warning. It's like, you guys got it. 40 days, this place is going to be taken over. You're not going to like it. And he leaves. And what do the people do? They repent. Everywhere Jonah goes, in Jonah's disobedience, the people come to God. The sailors came to God. The, the people of Nineveh come to God. Uh, come to God. They, uh, the, the scholars think that there could be about 600,000 people in Nineveh and the surrounding areas that may have come to the Lord. This is the biggest revival meeting that ever happened where everyone comes up and says, yes, I want to give my life to the Lord. Like that's never happened before or since. Not even Jesus had this percentage rate of success. Amazing. And Jonah's going to pout like a teenager about it. Like he should be walking around town teaching people how to live a godly life. He didn't give them any instruction. All he said is, you are going to be destroyed. And on their own volition, they said, well, maybe we should pray to God and ask him not to destroy us. And they did. And God loved that. So God didn't. That's chapter 3. Chapter 4 is Jonah's reaction. Now it's just Jonah and God and a worm in a plant. So that's like the, the, uh, the whole up to now. And, and I just like, have you ever heard your grandparents say, you know, when you were young, it's like, well, you shouldn't complain because when I was a kid, when I was your age, what is it? I had to walk five miles to school, barefoot, in the snow, uphill both ways. 
How does that work? Do you live higher than you did in the morning? I don't know. And so it's just like they do that. You know, and my parents didn't, didn't use that story. My mom has a real story. My, gra- my grandpa, when he, was, when he was a young boy, like 12, 13, he was kidnapped from his home, taken across the country in China, and, and, and given to this lady who paid somebody for a son. She was like, I want a son. I don't want to know how you got him. Here's some money. Bring me, bring me a boy. And he was raised by this woman. And he became a doctor. And he, he eventually we asked, like, did he go find his real family? And it's like, well, eventually he did. But, you know, when he was 12, 13, you can't travel across the country by yourself, not knowing where you're from or how to get there. And, and so, so he was raised. And then when he got older and had his family, uh, the communist revolution took over in China, and he was getting his family out, and they escaped to Hong Kong. And my mom was the middle child, middle of like eight. And she was, and when her mom died, when she was like 12 or 13, she became the mother of the house. Her older siblings had jobs, and they were off working, trying to, to, to earn money for the household and to save up to come to America, because that was their whole plan is to come to America. And they did. They, they saved up for, the, for one person to come to America, and they sent one person over, uh, the oldest one. And then, so she worked here and sent money back to bring the next one over. And then we had two people working, you know, and they eventually got everybody over. But like that was it. And then the younger ones were too young to go to, to you know, they, the, too young to take care of things. So my mom got stuck with all of it. And then when school came around, my mom didn't even get to go because she had to take care of the house. They lived in an apartment. They, they rented one room, all nine or ten of them, all, they went to one room in a two-bedroom apartment. Um, and, and, and there was no bathroom in, in, the, in the apartment. They had to go down the hall to use some kind of communal bathroom. Um, and she drew a picture of it once so we could see what it was like. And, and then so, so all of her younger brothers and sisters actually got to go to school, and she didn't even get to go because she had to take care of the house. So she learned by helping them with their homework. That's how she learned everything. And so you can imagine when I'm, you know, growing up in America in the 1980s going, oh, this is so hard. She's like, you want to hear what hard is? And she'd tell me. And it's just like, I can't complain about anything, can I? You know, and, and eventually they made it over. And she came to, to America. And then, you know, what, when she was here, she had to get a job. And she went to college. She had to get a GED and then go to college. Uh, and, and she didn't even speak English. So we had to learn English while doing those things all at the same time. So when I went to college, I'm like, college is really hard, mom. Nope. I get the lecture again. It is not hard. And I had to learn, and I did learn, to be very grateful for what I had. God's blessed me so much. And my dad's worked hard too, but, you know, he came from Scotland. It wasn't as bad as China. And so, so things were just a whole lot easier for him. But he had his own uh, hardships that he had to deal with. Uh, He got drafted in the army during Vietnam, you know, and so he didn't have to go overseas. He worked in an office, which I'm grateful for because according to him, he couldn't throw a grenade very far. Uh, But he never played baseball. He was from Scotland, right? Anyway, uh, the whole point of that, you're going to tell me you don't throw a grenade like a baseball. I know that, but that's just my funny excuse. Um, We have to learn to be blessed with what God's giving us and what God's working through us because we have so much. And we, we want our kids to have these great lives, and we give them so much. And what we lose sometimes is that gratefulness. I remember when I, was, when I started coming to church, it wasn't this one because I was living down in San Luis Obispo. It was Pastor Tony's church. You know that guy. You know the cartoon trapped in the human body? That guy. So I went to his church first, and before he got the building that they're in, well, that the church is still in, he's not there anymore. Before they got that building, they were at the vet's hall. And I'm sure you guys who've been here on here forever have remember the vet, vet's hall days. I wasn't here at the time, so I don't know. Did you guys have to set up chairs every morning and take them down after every service? And sometimes when you came in in the morning, did the whole place reek of alcohol because they had some kind of party there last night and there were beer cups all over the ground? It happens, right? So what do you do? Do you complain about it? No, you just pick it up and sweep. It's like church is coming in like a couple hours. We got to get this place cleaned up and you take care of it. And you're grateful for that. And the chair ministry is one of the best ministries that the church has. Because a bunch of people come together for a common purpose. No one's complaining. Everybody's trying to help out. Because if you're not helping out, there's no, you don't come. You don't show up. So everybody who is there wants to be there. 
Everybody's getting along. It is a great ministry. I met some wonderful people doing that chair ministry. When I said to Pastor Tony, I want to get involved, he said, well, show up at 6.30 and help set up chairs. I'm not a morning person. But okay, if that's what God wants me to do. And I loved it. I didn't love waking up early, but I loved the ministry. And, and like when you get a building and you get kind of comfortable here, you kind of lose that a little bit. And comfort, even though like it's good for us to rest, we get too comfortable at stuff it starts eating away at our spiritual lives. We kind of need to be uncomfortable, and God lets Jonah be uncomfortable in this chapter. Was that long enough for an intro? All right, let's get into verse 1. There's no, there's no limitation on how long an intro has to be, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Verse 1 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. What displeased Jonah? The last verse in chapter 3 talks about God not punishing Nineveh. You know what displeased Jonah? God's mercy. God not punishing them for what they deserve. That displeased Jonah. Does God's mercy displease you? Of course, we love mercy when, it, when we get mercy. But do we love mercy when somebody else gets mercy? Like they did a crime. They did a horrible thing. But then they kind of got away with it. You ever feel like, oh, he got away with it. He should have gotten punished. He should have went to jail. They got mercy. Now, not, not like they just escaped, right? It's just like they got caught, and, and then the person in charge, the judge, whoever says, all right, you can go. We'll just call it time served, and you can go. And you're like, that's not harsh enough. That's not bad enough. They need justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Now, in God's economy, he gives out mercy. He also gives out justice, but he, also, but he gives out mercy. He wants to give out mercy. He desires to give out mercy. And if he didn't give out mercy, none of us would be here. None of us would be alive. Because judgment for us is hanging on that cross. But instead of us hanging on that cross, Jesus hung on that cross. He got our judgment upon himself, and he gave us mercy. And that should please us. It pleases us for us, but it should please us for others as well, knowing that God loves them and has called them to repentance, just like he's called us to repentance. God's called them into his kingdom, just like he's called us into his kingdom. And the fact is, we're not really supposed to have enemies. God says, love your enemies because you need to love them. They don't like you, but you should love them. And if you love them right, they might not stay enemies. They might become friends or even brothers because of the love that they see that you have for them from and through Jesus Christ. But this displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Have any of you been angry at God? Has that ever worked out for you? Did, did God ever go, okay, I can see you're really angry, so we'll just do it your way this time? Does God ever say that? He just like, God's God. He knows better. If, if, if you're angry at God, then you have to realize that you don't know how big God is and how small you are. If you're angry at God, you think you're bigger than you are and you think God's smaller than he is because you think there's some kind of injustice. You think God doesn't know something or God isn't handling something right. According to what? If God is not your source for what is good and what is bad, what is? If you are judging that God is doing something incorrectly, you are saying that you know more than God knows. You are saying you are worthy to be God's judge. Now that frightens me. I never want to be in that place. I cannot be God's judge. We like to be each other's judges, don't we? Oh, I don't like our president and what he does. I don't like our senators or our con governor or whatever. You know, we just make things up and we judge what they do. And it's like, are we right? Maybe. But you know what? Whenever a president goes to war and I, I, I was like, oh, I don't think we should go to war or do that. It's like, but I have to realize I don't know everything he knows. Like the, 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 uh, all the army generals aren't coming to me to tell me the latest intelligence and information on, on, on the situation, so I can't say, oh, then we should go in or we shouldn't go in. I just have to realize I don't know. 
I realize I am not qualified to make that call. And some of us want to be armchair generals or armchair quarterbacks because we know better. But we have to realize we don't. <coughs> Only God knows. And so what we can do is we can trust. We may not trust uh, the people in government, but we can trust the Lord that he knows and he is in charge. And when it comes to who is greater and who is stronger and who is in charge, is it God or is it our government? It's God. So even if I disagree, because I think I know, I can rest knowing that God's in charge. And if they're making the wrong decision, guess who they have to answer to? Not me. I'd like them to answer to me, but they're not gonna. They gotta answer to God. And will he make the right decision at that time? Absolutely he will. Might we suffer a little more until then? Maybe. But Jesus suffered. And if we call ourselves follower of Jesus, what makes us think that we don't have to suffer in this world? I think sometimes we don't suffer enough. I think you should throw your phones in the garbage for a day and then you'll suffer, right? See what that's like. Things are too easy for us. Verse 2 so he prayed. And when you're angry, it's a good thing to pray. God will take you in your anger because you know what? You're talking to him. I'd rather you pray in anger at God because then he can answer you. And that might be fun for me. But I'd rather you pray angry to God than not pray to him at all. And try to ignore him and push him out of your life. That is the worst. If you're angry at him, tell him you're angry. And I, 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 I used to babysit this kid Back when I was in college and I had to, you know, I couldn't afford it, so I got three jobs. And one of them was babysitting this kid every weekend. His parents were uh, in retail, so they worked every weekend. And he'd get angry. And so I'd start with, why are you angry? And he'd tell me why he was angry. Is that worth getting angry about? Sometimes he'd say no, but sometimes he would say yes. Well, does, does being angry make you happy? No. Is being angry fun for you? No? Wouldn't you rather read a book or go play? Yeah? Well, then go do that. What's the point of being angry? It's not going to get you what you want. And I'd be, okay. And then he'd go do it. It's just like anger is something that we hold on to. And anger is something that we can let go of. I cannot imagine anywhere in the scriptures where anyone did anything right by being angry. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. That, that, that means because we get angry. It's not something that we always choose to do. It happens because of some circumstance. And it says, don't sin. Like, don't do stuff in your anger. Calm down first. And people like to say Jesus was angry. He turned the tables over in the temple. He was cleaning the house. It wasn't like he went there and go, what is this? I didn't know this was going on. Turn over, get out of here. It's not like he did that. He left the temple, went and made the whip of cords, and I don't know how long that takes, but you know, five minutes at least. Then he came back and then whipped it out. And he said, it's like, this is supposed to be a place of worship. You made it into a den of thieves. It wasn't like he was angry and out of control. He was cleaning house. Because for the Passover, you had to get all of the leaven out of your house. He was fulfilling prophecy in, in, in type. And getting his house ready to, be, to worship the Lord. That's what he was doing. Will God get angry? Yeah, God gets angry at sin. How, does, does God do stuff in anger, which is wrath? Yes, it is. Is it righteous? Yes, because it is him. It is not us. If we get angry and we do things in wrath, we are not trusting in God for justice. We are taking it into our own hands. So if you get angry and you realize you're angry, because you can't do it until you realize it, remember who God is. Remember that God is in control and remember that God will answer. And let go of it. Let him take care of it. He does it so much better than us. I mean, if I was like working with Jonah, if I was a fellow prophet and Jonah decided to run away from God, I'd be angry at Jonah. Jonah. If I was a supervisor, I don't know if they had supervisors other than God, I'd say, Jonah, you're fired. 
You're not going to do what God tells you to do? You, you're no use to us. You're fired. Get out of here. It's not what God said. God says, well, I'm going to give you a second chance. Get inside that whale. Or a fish. Whatever you want to call it. Verse 2 says, So we prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah admits it. He had a conversation with God about this before he ran away. It wasn't like God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And he says, later, and walks away. He had a conversation with him. He says, God, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I hate those guys. If I give them the, the, the message, they might repent, and then you will forgive them because I know you are a loving God. I know you give mercy. I know you are graceful. Like he knows these wonderful things about God, and it all comes down to he doesn't want the Ninevites to receive that mercy and grace. He hates them. He hates them. And what I find amazing is that God used him anyway to go to the Ninevites and give them the message where they repent. And they received God's loving kindness. They received God's grace. They received God's mercy through a prophet who hated them. Jonah's hatred did not stand in the way of God's righteousness. How awesome is that? How amazing and powerful is our God that he used Jonah in spite of himself to get his message across and say, he could have picked any other guy to go. Says, Jonah doesn't want to go? Yeah, sure, Gary, your turn. There's probably a prophet named Gary back there, right? Go do this, and Gary be like, yeah, sure, sounds like fun. You know, and he goes in and shares the gospel, but it's just that's not what happened. He used Jonah. God says go. Jonah didn't want to go, but he ended up going anyway. And then he, now he's angry at God for it. And I, the can you imagine that being, the, the, that's the, the argument he had against God. That is his complaint against God. You're too loving. You're too merciful and gracious. How cool would it be if we had enough Jesus in us that people would complain that about us? They're like, I don't like that Christian guy. He's too nice. Like, he helped me out with my rent last week. I didn't like that. He brought me food when I was sick. That's horrible. Like, how great would it be if people's complaint about us is that we're too nice and we're too loving that we talk about Jesus too much. That would be a wonderful complaint. Verse 3. Now, there, therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better to die than to live. Like, that's what he wants. These people are getting saved, and I just, I just want to die now. I think if he lived nowadays, he'd be goth. Or on the suicide watch somewhere, or both, right? It's just like, this guy, what is it with this guy? He'd rather die than see people get saved. These people, the people he hated. You know, and it's just like, this, this is some extreme racism. We think we're dealing with it in our country. Look at this. He would rather die than see them come to the Lord. On the other hand, we'd rather see everybody come to the Lord. Verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So God's actually asking the question. Now, Jonah doesn't even answer it. Is it right for you to be angry? Well, you know the answer. No. No, it's not. But what do we get angry about? When we get angry, is it right for us to be angry about whatever it is? What was the last thing you guys got angry about? Don't say it out loud. Your wife might be next to you. Okay? What was the last thing you got angry about? And think about the situation. Was it right to be angry about that thing, whatever it was? I'm guessing the answer is no. In the moment, we're like, yeah, I'm angry because of this, this, and she always does this, or he always says that. And the answer is, so what? So you get angry about it, and that helps the situation, right? That just finishes it, and you guys are best friends after you get angry. Is that how it works? Does that help? Does anger help your relationship? Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, there he made for himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade so that he might see what would become of the city. So he goes away from the city quite a distance, I bet, so he doesn't get singed in case God decides to send fire down from heaven and destroy the Ninevites. And he's just going, I'm going to sit and wait. You know, like his Netflix subscription was no good since the internet wasn't invented yet. 
And he's got to wait around for some kind of entertainment. Maybe he'll get a, he'll get a fireworks show out of this. Maybe. Like, how serious could those Ninevites possibly be about repentance? They know nothing about God. So maybe they'll, 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 they'll be like good for a day and then they'll go back on their thing and God will destroy them. Yeah, right. Well, of course, we read the story. We know what happens. Verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. God prepares again. I like how it says God prepares a lot in this book. God prepared the storm. God prepared the fish. God prepared the plant. He's a preparer. And this plant has got a purpose. And it's a blessing. It is a blessing for me. I grew up in the shade. It was hot there. It was almost as hot as it is in Chico in the summer. And, and Jonah was miserable. Of course he was miserable because he's angry. Have you ever been angry and happy? It's always angry and miserable. Uh, he was miserable. And so like this plant gave him some shade, some rest, some escape from the blazing hot sun. And he was grateful. The first time he was grateful in this whole book, right? He was never happy until now because he has his plant. He's got his shade and he's expecting a show. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. So it damaged the plant that it withered. God's preparing another thing, a worm. This worm's getting hungry. He's going to eat the plant. The plant's going to be destroyed. And now, no plant, full sun. Verse 8, And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint, and he wished for death for himself, said, It is better for me to die than to live. So now he's complaining again because it's too hot. Does anyone know what that's like, being really hot? I don't know, just, just asking. Um, and then God prepared again. He prepared the, the, you know, the, the storm. He prepared the fish. He prepared the plant. He prepared the worm. Now he's prepared this east wind. God is making Jonah's life uncomfortable. Because Jonah was too comfortable in the shade of that plant. And we can receive a blessing from the Lord and we can love that blessing and we can enjoy and be grateful for that blessing. But we can become so comfortable in the blessing of God that we don't step out of the blessing to take the next step in obedience. God says, go there. And you're like, I like it here. I have everything set up just the way I like it. I could close my eyes and walk through my house and not run into anything. I could cook dinner without looking because I know where everything is. Everything is perfect right here. And God says, great, go over there. Nobody where you are needs to hear the gospel. Go over there. Because we think sometimes that God's purpose here on earth is to make us more comfortable instead of realizing that our purpose here on earth is to spread the message of God. The simple gospel that everyone is a sinner. We deserve to die for our sins, but Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we could say yes to him and go to heaven forever. Like, we need to get that message out. There are people nowadays who grew up in America who have never heard that gospel before. Before I went to college, I had you know, 18 years of experience in a nice town. In a regular high school, I didn't know a thing about Christ. I don't even think I could tell you before, before I went to college that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I don't even think I knew that much. People need to know. And growing up in America doesn't mean you just know because people don't talk about it unless they're us, right? Are we going to talk about it? Are we going to share what we know? So simple to the people, starting with the ones we love. We don't have to go like to the people we hate yet. Like Jonah went to the Ninevites. You can just start with people you love. Are the people you love who've never heard the gospel? Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, grandkids, cousins, nephews, nieces, neighbors, friends, countrymen, anybody. People at the store, have they heard the gospel? Have they had the opportunity to say yes to Jesus? That's your job and mine. And it's simple. Even if you just start with the people that you already love, make sure they all know. Verse 8, and it happened when the... No, I read that one already. He just wishes he was, he was dead again. Verse 9, then Jonah... Then, no, sorry, then God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah, God's asking Jonah again, is it right for you to be angry? And this time it's about the plant. 
And this is the last thing that Jonah says in this book. He says, it is right to be, for me to be angry, even to death. I'm going to take this fight to the grave. I'm going to be angry about this plant until I die, and I hope that's today. You know, it's just like the drama in this. It's like, are you in high school, Jonah? What's going on here? He's supposed to be an old man by now, and old men are supposed to be wiser. Not always the case, is it? He wants to be angry, even to death. And verse 10, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant, which you have not labored, nor made it grow, and it came up in a night and perished in a night. Jonah, you love this plant, and you didn't work for it one bit. It came, and it was gone. Verse 11, and and should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, much, and much livestock. And that's the last verse God says in the, in, in the book of Jonah. It's like, you cared for the plant, but should I not care even more for this city? 120,000 people who can't tell the right hand from their left. So either the Ninevites are really stupid, which I doubt, or these are the children. 120 children, 120,000 children who are so young, they don't even know left from right. And the animals completely innocent of all the wrongdoing that their parents are doing. Do you think God cares about them? Yeah, he cares about them. Think Jonah cares about them? No. God says, you cared for a plant. I care for these people, and I care for their animals. He loves them. And you know what? He loves us too. What makes you think that we're better than the Ninevites? They were violent. They were sinners. Have you looked around lately? Have you looked at the news lately? We're violent. We're sinners. America is bad. And we've kicked God out of our schools. We've kicked God out of our courtroom. We've kicked God out of any, every government space that we could think of. And I'm sure there are people trying to get scripture scratched off the walls at the memorials in Washington, D.C. Like, We're telling God as a country, not as individuals, of course, but as a country, we don't want you here. The Ninevites didn't even know him. They acted out of ignorance. We knew and we decided that we didn't want him. How horrible is that? You think God loves us? Absolutely he does. You think God cares about us? Absolutely he does. Do you think God wants to save us? Absolutely he wants to save us. But he is not going to force anybody. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He made the way pure and simple. And the only thing that stops you from going to heaven is your answer to this question. Will you be mine? If you say yes to Jesus and you're willing to be his, he will change your life miraculously. It will be wonderful. And it'll be hard. It's not going to be easy. But you know what? Life is hard anyway. But it'll be simple and it will be better. It all comes down to you. Will you say yes to Jesus? Or will you continue to say no? And if you're like, oh, let me answer that later. It's not a yes or a no. It's a no. When I asked my wife to marry me, the first thing she said was, ah! It was a good scream. It was an excited scream. But then I said, that's not a yes. And then she said yes. So she meant, the scream meant yes. She was just excited. And so, like, it was good. But, like, if she said anything else, if she said, well, let me think about it tonight, you know what that means? No. I mean, she might say yes tomorrow, but right now it's a no. She's not, she would not be willing to marry me at that moment if she didn't say yes. And it's the same thing between you and Jesus. If you're here at church because someone brought you and you haven't given your life to the Lord yet, I don't know what you're waiting for, but figure it out. Jesus is asking you again and again and again, will you be mine? He promises to love and care for you. He promises to send his spirit to live inside you. He promises to speak to you through his scriptures. 
and he promises to make your heart anew and to make you a new creation every single morning. The sins of yesterday are yesterday's sins. They are in the past. They are paid for on that cross. Today you start out anew. You start fresh. God offers all of that to you if you would just say yes. But you know what he wants from you? He wants your sin. He wants to take it away from you. He wants to make you sinless. I mean, it takes a while, right? Some of us have been on this road for, for a few decades, and we're like, God, you're not done with me yet. And he's like, nope, not even close. But I'm working on you. He wants your, your allegiance. He wants your devotion. Because through your allegiance and your devotion, he can work in your life. If you're like, okay, God, I'll give my life to you when I die. But until then, I got some things I want to do first. It doesn't work that way. And God's saying, well, then you're saying no for now. And later on, maybe you'll say yes. But God's asking you that question. And the question is, how are you going to answer? Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Jonah. Thank you for his... Thank you for his anger and his disobedience, Lord, that we get to see what it looks like when a prophet rebels against you and how sovereign you are to get your message out there anyway. And Lord, I'm sure Jonah repented eventually because he had to write the book. And, and we thank you for the humility that he had in writing it, that he did not cover up the stuff that makes him look bad because he looks horrible. It looks like he wrote a book on how to not be a prophet of God, but God's cool anyway. But when it comes to us, Jesus, that question remains. You ask if we will be yours. Lord, I pray that we would say yes. Not just once, but we would say it every day. Yes, I still want to be yours. I still want to be yours. I still want to be yours. And so I ask that question tonight. Is there anyone in here who wants to say yes to Jesus for the first time? You've heard the gospel many times tonight. You're a sinner. The wages for your sin is death. That's what you deserve. But Jesus died on that cross for you so that you wouldn't have to die for your sins and so that you can go to heaven to be with him forever. Is there anyone who wants to accept Jesus for the first time tonight? To say, yes, Jesus, I'm yours. Maybe you want to, but you're not sitting in this room. You're watching online or something. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And I know I deserve to die for, this, for my sins, even death on that cross. But Jesus, you died on my cross. You died for me so that I could live for you. And you rose again on the third day. Jesus, please be my God. Let me be your child forever and ever. Jesus, I say yes to you, starting today. I love you, Jesus. Pray this in your holy name. Amen.